Hey everyone, and welcome to this year's halftime update. Every quarter, we do a screencast that's a little bit longer than most of our content, uh, where we go over some details about the stock market. Sometimes we'll talk about interest rates, we'll go over uh, commodities, international stocks, domestic stocks, sectors. Um, today, we're going to focus on the US stock market. We're going to talk a little bit about rates, we're going to go a little bit uh, into detail on what could go right this next six months and what could go wrong. And we're also going to kind of dig a little bit deep into the U.S. stock market, which is currently the leading asset class and has been for a while now, really uh, with, with very, very short-term um, instances, the U.S. stock market um, has really been a leader over international stocks. And I'll show you in a couple different ways uh, why I say that, but it's been a leader over international stocks pretty much since 2009. Um, so obviously a really, really long time. But um, And then we'll just kind of finish up with uh, a couple things to think about, you know, some, th some things to focus on that you can control um, while obviously trying to discourage you from worrying too much about the things that you can't control. So Let's go ahead and jump in here. Uh, first and foremost, just so you know how to get a hold of me, um, our office, all of our information is here, our website at libertaswealth.com. If you'd like to get more screencasts, podcasts, articles, educational articles, and things of that nature, they're all on our website on the education tab, um, and you can find more information as well uh, our, through our company at Libertas Wealth Management Group on Twitter at LibertasWM as well as you can follow me on Twitter. I'm kind of sporadic. Sometimes if there's a lot going on, I'll be more active than uh, if there's just, if the market's pretty muted that I won't, I won't really post a lot. But um, uh, then on Instagram as well at Financial Surgeon. And then we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Libertas Wealth. Um, I always like to start with a quote, and I think this is really applicable today. This this has been an interesting year. We, we had the you know, COVID last year, which out of COVID emerged all these growth stocks, names like Zoom, you know, uh, everybody's using Zoom these days. Um, people are probably sick of using Zoom these days. Um, but we had, um, you know, Teladoc, we had um, Tesla obviously was a big winner last year. Um, we there, there were just so many growth stocks, um, call it low dividend or no dividend payers, that were just screaming out of the gate that last half of the year, once COVID uh, the, started to fade away in people's minds and the economy started to open up. And uh, then at the, the beginning of this year, that lasted about a month. And in February and March, uh, really both of those months, for over a six week period, we started to see the growth stocks really get beat up. And um, basically all the leaders that were leading the market last year very quickly turned around and all of a sudden we started seeing big drops in value in these stocks, these growth stocks, um, even if it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So for instance, uh, a company like DocuSign, you know, for, for DocuSign to go down as much as it did, uh, as if all of a sudden nobody's going to use any more um, paperless documents anymore because the economy's opened up. I don't know about you, but I don't think we want to go back to carbon copy and signing everything by hand. Um, and then you got things like Netflix, you know, all of a sudden now the economy is opening up. So we're going to unsubscribe from Netflix. I don't think so. So there's, but there's been this rotation that's existed where the strength has gone away from those growth stocks into more value oriented stocks, high dividend payers, and then back in a very short period of time. And this, this rotation, this very quick rotation, has made the market really messy. And so the quote that um, I wanted to put up here is one that has, for the most part, uh, changed a few times this year, but it's, uh, I'll call uh, one of my favorite authors, Mark Minervini. He's uh, won the U.S. Investing Championships um, in, at least a couple times. I know he's in the, in the uh, running right now to win this year. And... Uh, he has, he has said this on Twitter, online, and I've seen this quote in a couple variations so many times, and this is what he says. He says, I've been pointing out for months that while indices or indexes, market major market indexes, have made headlines, that it's been a completely different story under the surface. We have had a bear market, in other words, a down market in growth leaders, and we may not see an easier dollar environment 
until growth stocks meaningfully break out. And what he means by that is uh, even the stocks that tend to rotate back into favor that were those growth leaders, what seems to be happening a lot this last few months is they'll pop, um, whether that's on earnings or news or it doesn't really matter, and then they'll drop. So you get this pop and drop effect where they're really, and all the breakouts, you know, typically in a healthy market, stocks will break out and then they'll hold, maybe chop sideways and then head higher from there. And it's just, we're just not seeing a lot of that out of the growth names that are typically leading the market. So it's uh, it's been a really, really interesting time. Now, what about going forward? So market seasonality, I like to talk a lot about because even though it's it's uh, historical data, it doesn't mean uh, just because what I'm showing you here, the, the third quarter for the market is historically the worst quarter for the market. And that's what we're walking into here. So July, August, September are the worst three months for the market typically, but that doesn't mean it has to be the worst a quarter this year. We'll have to see what happens, but this history gives us some information. It gives us clues as to um, what we can expect and therefore manage our risk accordingly. So you can see here that when you look at the four quarters of the market going back to 1950, uh, including 2020, by the way, which Obviously, COVID happened during kind of the first and second quarter, tail end of the th uh, first beginning of the second quarter. But uh, you can see here that the third quarter has an average rate of return of 0.7%. And that's compared to the first quarter at 2.1, second quarter at 2, and then the fourth quarter being the best quarter for the market uh, with an average, in, uh, average rate of return of 4% uh, for that quarter. This is another way of visualizing it. Same information. This is just looking at election years. So since 1950, July uh, has been one of the best uh, best months for the market uh, in post-election years. When you look at the past 20 years, it's a little bit better. But during the past 10 years, July has been extremely uh, extremely positive, and we got we'll see here November and April. So only November and April have been better than July. And then when you look at post-election years, it's by far the best month for the market in post-election years, uh, which is, again, what we're living in today. Here's another way of visualizing it, um, as opposed to looking at it in bar charts and tables. This is just a chart of the market showing that the market has a tendency, the stock market, we're saying the S&P 5, uh, 500 here since 1990, has had a tendency to peak out sometime around July and then to chop sideways with a downward bias pretty much until the, uh, call it mid to the end of October, after which you get that big, huge bump uh, in the fourth quarter, which again reflects that average 4% rate of return that we looked at a second ago on the previous page. Of course, one of the concerns that um, you may have heard, or if, if you watch any sort of financial news, is the price to earnings ratios on the S&P 500, um, which are getting a little frothy. So when I say frothy, long on the tooth, pick your, uh, uh, I don't know, pick your analogy or your, uh, your saying here, but uh, I don't know who they are, but what they say is that, you know, when, uh, when things get long on the tooth, sometimes they have a tendency to mean revert. And what we're seeing here on the chart here is the uh, forward-looking PE price to earnings ratio on the S&P 500, which if you draw a line here vertically, uh, we're sitting at about 20 right now. And in the 2000 uh, tech bubble, when the dot-com bubble burst, the P.E. ratios were sitting at around 24. We're kind of hovering between 22 and 24. So so basically, we're kind of getting to a point where we're starting to see some of those um, overbought, frothy numbers. Again, call it long in the tooth. Um, and uh, what does that mean? Well, does it mean that uh, the market has to go through a crash like it did in 2000, 2001, 2002? No, it doesn't. Um, does it, is it possible the market could continue going higher from here uh, for a lot longer? Absolutely, I think it could, um, especially when we have the Federal Reserve on our side, especially when we have uh, billions of dollars of bonds being purchased, you know, triple B rated and higher bonds being purchased on a weekly basis, essentially help propping up the bond market. Um, as long as we have stimulus packages coming out um, on pretty much a quarterly basis, um, the most recent one being the infrastructure a stimulus bill, which is expected to get passed by no later than September. Um, so there's with with so much stimulus and economic activity coming from the Fed, um, I find it very hard to believe that we would see a crash uh, anytime in the near future anyhow. Speaking of uh, the future, let's look longer term here. 
So this is a monthly chart. So every candlestick's a monthly chart. And this is something that I've been putting in my screencasts, my articles on the market, these, these updates, you know, market outlook updates, halftime updates for literally a few years. Um, so I've been watching this potential negative divergence. In other words, lower highs in momentum with higher highs in price. And these red vertical bars or rose colored vertical bars are times when the market was below its 10 month moving average. Um, generally speaking, uh, when, when the S&P 500, the Dow, uh, the NASDAQ, when it's trading below its 10 month moving average, which is a long term trend line, um, it's, it's typically considered a risk off environment, meaning an environment where you don't wanna be taking risk. And you can see how we've had a lot of those really, really quick, fast, uh, we'll call them whipsaws, where, the, where we went below it and above it and below it and above it. And that's made this environment extremely difficult for trend following strategies and tactical strategies. Um, but below the surface here, when we look at momentum, this is RSI, a 14 month RSI, relative strength index, this, these lower highs in momentum indicated that we could see some negative price action that's more longer term uh, in the future. But then as you can see, this past year, we broke north of that descending trend line in uh, momentum. And not only did we break north of it, but we're back above 70, which would, which is considered to be a bullish regime. In fact, I didn't mark it down here, but uh, the lowest low never cracked below 40. And uh, what we really want in a positive market environment is we want momentum to stop below, uh, above 30. In other words, we don't, when it goes down, when we see these lows, we don't wanna see momentum cross below 30 because that would be bearish. It would be a bearish regime. Um, so what we really wanna see though in a very positive market, as much as it's been really hard to feel like it's been a positive market this past few years, is to see that momentum stop at 40. That's even better. Um, that, that's indicative of a very strong market. And I guess what I'm saying here is that that's what we saw was a bottom above 40 a break northward from that descending trend line and momentum, a break above 70, which keeps us in a bullish regime long term, um, which again, combined with stimulus and everything else that's going on fundamentally, I think uh, there's still probably a lot of positive left in this market uh, and more legs left um, before we start seeing crashes, regardless of what your thoughts are on inflation and so on, which we'll talk about in a second here, interest rates. Um, so here's a ranking system, a monthly ranking system that I use uh, here at our office. Uh, right now, the number one ranked asset class, if you break it down by not just asset classes, but large and mid and small cap, um, is small cap uh, U.S. stocks. So the number one winner here on a long-term basis. Number two is commodities. Number three is large cap stocks. And number four is international stocks. Uh, number five, if we want to keep going here, would be just money markets, treasuries. Um, this is kind of a, a risk on, risk off parameter. So if we start to see treasuries ranking higher than stocks, that's obviously not a good sign, but clearly that's not what we're seeing right now. And uh, in bonds, this is a 20 year treasury bond um, is actually ranked below cash. So it's been an interesting, really interesting time for bonds. Um, bonds were down, I believe, I'd have to look back, but I believe the bonds were down somewhere in the ballpark of 24%, maybe higher on the 20 year treasury from August through uh, a couple months ago. Now we've seen a bounce recently and I don't have a chart for it today, but but still uh, it's been a really messy environment for bonds. It's been, you'd have to be very selective in terms of the bonds you own. So things like senior debt and treasury inflation protected securities, which have even been pretty choppy regardless of the inflation environment, um, convertible bonds, things like that. High yield bonds have been perking up lately, um, but bonds have been tough. You know, it's a tough market for bonds, tough, which means it's a tough market for uh, conservative portfolios, by the way, um, makes it not as easy to keep that a kind of smooth ride in your portfolio when bonds aren't acting uh, like they should be, or at least they're not acting smoothly. Somebody was asking me uh, yesterday, we got an email from uh, a new client who was asking, you know, what our thoughts were on international investments and um, what, uh, what I thought um, might happen going forward and whether we'd be, you know, dipping our toes in the water a little heavier, maybe putting our leg in, legs in the water with the international investments. And my response was that, you know, at least one of the things that need to happen, aside from obviously the ranking or the trend of U.S. versus international stocks needs to lean and then that trend needs to change 
in the direction or in favor of international stocks first before we want to start taking risk in that category. You know, we don't want to just invest in international stocks arbitrarily, of course, um, just to be quote unquote diversified. Um, we want to stay with, invested in the things that are exhibiting high relative strength. Um, and we want to avoid the rest. As the analogy I always use is we want to invest in the playoff teams. You know, if there's 32 teams in the NFL, I mean, we can use any sport, hockey, soccer, baseball, uh, football, but in, I'll just use the NFL. If there's 32 teams in the NFL and um, only 16 of them go to the playoffs each year, what we want to do is we want to stay invested in those top-ranked playoff teams. We want to avoid the rest. So um, so anyway, uh, another thing that needs to happen, I think, or that would be very helpful and would add some tailwind to the international markets or international stocks would be to see a trend change in the U.S. dollar. Um, if we have a stock here in the U.S., that's trading at $100 a share, and we have a stock internationally that's trading at $100 a share, and the U.S. dollar goes down 5%, that is going to boost the returns on an international stock, the, the $100 international stock, um, even if the price doesn't change. So we have what's called currency risk, you know, and that, that risk can work for us or against us. And at least for the last several years, as I was mentioning earlier, International stocks just have not been able to sustainably outpace domestic stocks for a long time. But um, if we were to see a break below this line here, this line in the sand, which marks the lows from April and May, uh, June, July, call it summer, spring and summer of 2016, it was also a fa false breakdown and then a breakdown in 2017 and 18, but then it came right back up again. We saw the dollar kind of peak out and then go nuts uh, like a lot of things did during COVID. And then we've seen the dollar descending and kind of running into this line in the sand here over and over again. And it just can't seem to make up its mind. If we were to see the dollar stay below this line in the sand and then if we saw a trend change um, where the dollar started to move southward, then I think that we would start to see a lot more leadership come out of international markets for those of us who live in the U.S., where the investments we're buying are denominated in U.S. dollars. Um, if we if we go back to just the U.S. stock market again, a couple things I wanted to share. Um, I was mentioning growth stocks and how they'd been beaten up. I mean, I can pull up anything here. Technology stocks were beaten up really, really bad. <clears throat> this is solar stocks right here. This is uh, the symbol is TAN, T-A-N, uh, the solar ETF. And you can see here that uh, this from, from top to bottom intraday, the solar ETF peaked out in uh, January, and then it fell um, at the beginning of May, it fell as much as 46%, 46.2 to be exact. That's a big drop in value. And when I say value, I mean price, the, a big drop in the, in the price of those stocks. Now, uh, they've started to perk back up again, and this is a, a workbook that I use. It's called a relative rotation graph, invented by my friend uh, Julius de Campanaire. And what I'd been watching this last few weeks, every one of these dots on these arrows here, these tails, is one week. And this is the lagging quadrant down here, bottom left. This is improving versus the market. Upper right would be beating the market or leading the market. And then bottom right would be weakening versus the market or starting to weaken. And what I've been watching here is technology, genomics, IPOs. Um, this is uh, marijuana stock, so cannabis. We're starting to see online retail perk up. This is blockchain down here. But especially genomics, technology, and solar stocks um, have started to perk up. Now, we want these things to be pointing northeast. We want them to head into or continue into the improving quadrant and then continue northward. What we don't want to see is what we saw happen with gold recently and gold miners, which was this northeasterly movement from uh from lagging to leading, a continued northeasterly movement from improving toward leading, but then it just kind of hit a brick wall and headed back down, which means that, again, um, when, when we start to see this southward movement on a relative rotation graph, or RRG for short, then that shows us that the investment in question is, on a relative basis, weakening versus the market. So right now, the things that I'm really interested in are, are things that are starting to perk back up again that have gotten really beaten up the first part of the year here. Um, and again, like th these are things like solar stocks, technology, IPOs, and so on. Um, and as this rotation continues, 
Obviously, we want to stay invested in the investments that are exhibiting that high relative strength. Um, and think of it again, playoff teams. And as uh, as those investments start to weaken, then we want to take them out of our portfolio and replace them with the new playoff teams. Um, if I go, if I expand on that just for a second, one of the things I like to say a lot as an analogy is that um, you know we can be a playoff team and we can lose a game. We can be a playoff team and we can lose a few games. You can have a losing streak. You just can't lose so many games to the point where you're not a winning, you don't have a winning record anymore um, as an investment, that is. And uh, if you don't have a winning record, you're not going to make the playoffs and you don't deserve any spot portion. We, you don't deserve any spots in our portfolio. So um, right now, you know, we've got, um, you know, solar stocks, which basically had a horribly losing record, right along with technology and genomics and IPOs and blockchain, um, even online retail. Again, going back to earlier when I said that, you know, we're opening up the economy um, and uh, online retail stocks started acting as if people were going to go back to the mall and start shopping again. Um, We're just out to dinner with my parents and my wife and two boys last night, and we were just joking about how we haven't been to a mall and who knows how long. And apparently the malls uh, near us, one of the malls near us, I should say, um, a lot of the stores are closed. Somebody was telling us at dinner uh, that was sitting near our table. So I don't know because I haven't gone to the mall, but I do know that I just bought two pair of pants on uh, sportinggoods.com and I did not go down to the store to do it. Um, But anyway, I digress. So anyway, so we have the last thing uh, I want to talk about here before I go over kind of what I think could go right versus what I think could go wrong through the last half of this year is the spooky interest rates. You know, one of the things that people are worried about is what happens to my portfolio or what happens to the stock market if interest rates start to go up? You know, so if the Fed, Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve starts to hike rates. Now, this is going to happen eventually. It's got to happen. I believe that uh, the most recent report that came out um, is, you know, Jerome Powell's plans on increasing rates in 2023. You know, it's quite a ways away, of course, but, you know, it'll be here before we know it. And what we're looking at here, this table, it's this is the date on the left here, the date of the first interest rate hike going back. Um, let's see here. There's not a beginning date, but um, 1987 is the first one. So it's the date of the first interest rate hike. And then the performance of the S&P 500 over the next three months, six months, and 12 months. And I don't, I hope nobody cares about what happens to their portfolio in three months. Because if, if you're in, if you're worried about what happens to your portfolio in three months or even six months, then you probably shouldn't have the money invested anyway. Um, Truly, if you're, if you're planning on spending your money, any amount of money that you have in your portfolio within the next 12 to 24 months, it really shouldn't be invested in the stock market. Um, it just There's too much short-term risk. Um, uh, t- and you don't want to lose that money, or any portion of it, I should say. You're not going to lose it all, but you don't want to lose a, bo- a portion of that money if it's, if it's earmarked for an expense that you have on the docket. So um, that being said, uh, you can see here that when you look at all these interest rate hikes going back to 1987, that the average rate of return was a positive half percent for three months Median was down 1.1. When we go out six months, the average was 7.1% to the positive side. Median was 6.6. And if you go out a full year, there was only one year where 12 months later, the market was down. And that's because of Black Monday in 1987 in October. Otherwise, if it weren't for Black Monday um, and all the things that were going over in Iran, um, the boat being sunk and all that fun stuff, um, this would probably be a positive number if it weren't for that. But needless to say, when you average out all these time frames, interest rates going up does not mean the stock market's going to go down. I guess that's my point. Um, so six months, 12 months, the numbers look good. Um, obviously, anything can happen. That doesn't mean they have to be positive this this time. But I would say that history's on our side. The evidence is positive anyhow. Um, and I don't think it would be a reason to, to be freaking out and... Um, you know, taking all your money and putting it in CDs and cash, or or if you have cash on the sidelines, leaving it there in fear that the market might go down as a result of this. So let's talk about a couple things here. What what could go right? You know, this next uh, six months, we'll call it so through the last half of the year, because this is the halftime update. So the last half of the year, some things that could go right is that the Delta variant of the COVID vaccine could be subdued with with the vaccine. So um, this Delta variant of COVID. Uh, it keeps kind of coming up internationally, and what we what we're hearing is that the vaccine is actually working very well uh, so far, anyhow. Um, that whether or not it works well through the winter months here in the United States remains to be seen, um, but that would be good. 
uh, earnings. Uh, so far, we've, we've, earnings have been very, very good on, on companies here in the U.S. And as these earnings reports continue to come out and as they, um, through the second quarter, what we started to see was we'd see uh, earnings come out, and even if they were positive, the stocks would go down. And that's, you might think, well, why in the world would it go down? And, and the reason for that is that investors aren't, they're either taking profits um, because, you know, regardless of whether the earnings are good or bad, um, they want to take their profits off the table or they want to protect their money and they just want to go to cash or they want to buy something else, maybe bonds, who knows. But the, they, don't, they aren't believing in the, the sustainability or the, the, a sustained long-term uh, growth rate on these companies uh, going out into the future. So that's the third thing. If we continue to get good earnings through this third quarter, so earnings will start coming out here uh, very soon, then we could get investors believing in it, which means that they would probably invest more money in stocks. And when you consider the fact that there's still a lot of cash on the sidelines, uh, savings rates are still very, uh, very high. Uh, we uh, The work from home movement has created a lot of savings in uh, households around the country um, because they're not spending as much money on gas. They're not eating out as much. Um, so that's another piece. Uh, and then yields. You know, if, you, if yields were to spike, if interest rates were to spike, um, and in, inflation were to spike, that would be a problem. Um, so as long as in, inflation remains temporary, yields don't spike, forcing the Fed to take action um, that we don't want them to, um, being, you know, less accommodative, then I think that, uh, I think that, we, that we could have a really good last half of the year. Um, now, what could go wrong? Well, kind of the opposite of all those things. Uh, COVID coming back, um, the vaccine not working so well against the Delta variant um, or any other variant or mutation that may occur between now and then, um, which could cause new targeted lockdowns. It could cause uh, people to go on defense. Um, it could cause a short-term market drop. Um, I, don't, I don't see it happening like, like we saw last year. I don't see a 34% market drop happening again like we did last time but you know it could cause a market correction for sure you know call it a 10 15 percent drop that could happen really fast um if uh, i mentioned earlier if uh, interest rates were to spike um if the fed is kind of underestimating inflation and they don't take uh, the proper action um then that could cause some problems you know that could cause the fed to to be forced to taper a lot of their stimulus uh, which could definitely spook the market um, and cause some, 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 well, cause some issues that could then turn into a domino effect, um, not just with, uh, with interest rates and with Fed tapering, but it could also cause some issues with um, inflation. Um, this government debt problem could come to the forefront. Um, so we're just going to have to kind of watch and see what happens this next six months and see how all these things play out. But again, um, the biggest concern would be inflation and interest rates or yields. So those are the two I'm, I'm probably paying the closest attention to. Um, but I think that, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, as long as the Fed's on our side, as long as there is stimulus coming to play, and as long as earnings keep coming out and companies are making money um, uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, those numbers are good, then I think we can get, start to see more and more people, investors, believing in this economy and believing that it's sustainable and seeing more money being added to the market. And obviously, it's just supply and demand. You know, The more buying pressure or buying power that we have, uh, the more prices go up. So if buying power is better than or stronger than selling pressure, price must rise. If selling pressure is stronger than buying power, then price must fall. And what we want, obviously, is to see that balance, that, that imbalance, I should say, favor, uh, obviously, buying power and higher prices. Um, a couple more things uh, before we end here. Again, uh, it's halftime, right? We're halfway through the year. Today uh, is, I'm recording this on the 1st of July. We'll be sending it out tomorrow. If you're a subscriber to our uh, Libertas uh, YouTube page, then you're going to get this before everybody else does. But um, we'll send it out. We'll send it out tomorrow. Now we're going to have the six month period uh, to to pay attention to headlines, uh, to get anxious, <laughs> to get worried, um, to to get concerned about your portfolio. What I want you to do is not do that. I want you to focus on the things you can control, and you cannot control what the stock market's going to do this next six months. You cannot control what interest rates are going to do, what inflation is going to do, what Jerome Powell is going to do, the Fed. None of that. None of that's going to matter. Um, and especially if you have um, a qualified expert, financial advisor, uh, and portfolio manager uh, working for you, um, I don't think you should have to worry about that anyhow. Because there sh they should have a strategy in place to mitigate these risks should they occur. What you should focus on 
If you're a business owner, uh, some of the things you ought to be thinking about right now is whether or not you're missing out on this new employee retention credit that just came out. Um, this is uh, an ERC for short, employee retention credit, that could get you up to $7,000 this year per employee per quarter if you lo if if you meet certain qualifications. So if you remember, excuse me, if you remember last year um, when there was two versions of the PPP loan, then this is not the PPP, but it's getting brushed under the rug. People don't know about it. And if you're a business owner and your business was affected, by COVID last year, then you could get an employee retention credit this year, again, of up to $7,000 per employee per quarter. And if you have interest in learning more, please, by all means, reach out to me, email me. Uh, my email is adam at libertaswealth.com. Um, and then I have our contact information that I showed you earlier. I'll pull it up here again in a second. But um, second of all, if you're a business owner, do you know what your company's worth? And did you know that companies right now are selling at some of the highest multiples seen in all of U.S. history. Truth, truthfully, um, you talk to M&A firms and, and business brokers, and um, there's worry that we may be reaching a peak uh, here in the next few years in terms of the high, it being the highest point at which p business or businesses are being sold um, in terms of valuation. So, um, do you know what your company's worth? And if not, you know that's one of our specialties here at our offices. Um, value, um, value acceleration and building value within the company, not just increasing your EBITDA and increasing your revenue, but also increasing your multiple. If you're a pre-retiree, so if you're somebody who is not yet retired, you're working, you're saving, um, you're, you're putting money into a 401k plan, are you, are you saving enough into that 401k, IRA, Roth IRAs, what have you, to make work optional someday? Or are you just trying to hit your employer's matching contribution, maybe put a little bit more in? Um, if you're maxing out your 401k, good for you. Most people don't. And if you're maxing out your 401k, that's wonderful. But I would still ask you, do you know, even though you're maxing out your 401k, do you know if that's enough to retire? Not only when you want to retire, but with the lifestyle that you desire, you and your, your spouse, your family. And then if you're retired already, if you're somebody that's listening or watching this, and you're already retired, um, have you had a cash flow analysis performed any time in the recent history, especially since COVID, um, that shows you that between now and the end of your life that you're never ever gonna run out of money, conservatively speaking? Um, so these are all things that we do here at our office, um, things we would love to help you with, um, or someone you know if you get into any nerdy uh, conversations about financial planning, retirement planning, estate planning, and so on, um, then we're here to help uh, either you or your friends, your family members, your coworkers, colleagues. So thank you for uh, taking the time to listen today. Again, this is our contact information. If you'd like to reach out to us, uh, you can check us out online at LibertasWealth.com. You can follow us on Twitter. The company uh, Twitter handle is LibertasWM. Uh, my Twitter handle is Adam Koch, uh, K-O-O-S that is, Koch, like kosher dill pickles. <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Financial Surgeon. We're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Libertas Wealth. And uh, again, if you have any questions at all, um, please know that there's no such thing, just like just like elementary school, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, we always joke that's why we have a job. <laughs> so if you have any questions at all, if you'd like to discuss your personal situation uh, confidentially uh, through a, an introduction call, you can go to our website. You can schedule a call on our calendar. You can actually get access to our calendar on our contact page. Um, and if... Uh, if you'd like to have an introduction meeting and go over your personal situation and your financial plan, your retirement plan, or if you don't have a financial or retirement plan, then by all means, reach out to us and let's talk about how that works, what our process is for giving second opinions. Um, it is a no cost, no obligation process, and we would love to help out. So hope you're having a wonderful summer. At least for me, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of this hot weather, but uh, just try to stay inside <laughs> as long as it's not too hot. But uh, um, here in Ohio, anyway, we're expecting mid 70s. I might even get a chance to go out and play some golf this long weekend. So happy Fourth of July to everybody out there, and thank you for taking the time to listen. We'll see you next time. <laughs>